The following episode examines a case involving a child under the age of 10. Some details may be disturbing to listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Nine-year-old Christine Jessup was bright, bubbly, and full of life. She enjoyed spending time with her pet dog, running around outside, climbing trees, playing baseball, and riding her prized bike. On the afternoon of October 3rd, 1984, all of that was stolen from her. After arriving home from school, Christine headed to a local store to buy some gum, one of her favorite things. She never returned home, and the last people to see her were those passing by the store, making note of a sweet little girl carrying a plastic recorder. Groups of police and local volunteers came together for an extensive search, but nothing could be found. While Christine remained missing, authorities began closing in on a potential suspect, a somewhat quiet and withdrawn 23-year-old neighbor. When Christine's remains were recovered nearly three months after her disappearance, that neighbor became the prime suspect. Over the course of the next decade, investigators would bend evidence, manipulate timelines, and outright lie about alleged evidence to gain a conviction. When that conviction was overturned due to DNA evidence, it became clear that Tunnel Vision had put an innocent man in prison while the killer remained free to roam the streets. By the time the truth was revealed, Christine's case had already grown cold. Now, nearly 35 years to the day of her disappearance, we examine this horrible case in hopes that somewhere, someone may have the key piece of information necessary to bring a nine-year-old justice and a family the bleak comfort of closure. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 92, The Abduction and Murder of Christine Jessup. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the details surrounding the horrifying abduction and murder of nine-year-old Christine Jessup. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at TraceEvPod, on Instagram at Trace Evidence Podcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash trace evidence, where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. In October of 1984, nine-year-old Christine Jessup was abducted, assaulted, and murdered on her way home from buying a pack of gum. For 35 years, her family has wondered who committed this heinous crime and for 35 years, they've had no answers. This is episode 92, The Abduction and Murder of Christine Jessup. Christine Marion Jessup was born on November 29, 1974 in Ontario, Canada, to parents Janet and Bob. At the time of her birth, Christine was the second child of the Jessups, having an older brother named Kenny. Christine would be raised in Queensville, a small village within the town of East Gwillimbury. While the town covers nearly 95 square miles, or 245 square kilometers, and has a population of nearly 24,000 residents, Queensville is a small subsection of the area with a population of just over 600. For the most part, Queensville is thought of as a quiet and peaceful area, a wonderful place to raise a family as it has low crime and is, in general, a close and tight-knit community. However, for the Jessup family, a horrible memory hangs over the little village of Queensville, and for those who were there at the time, they are not likely to forget. 
Christine has been described by both friends and family as an extremely sweet and caring little girl. One detail which seems to come up a lot when reading about Christine is her love for animals. When Christine was just four years old, her parents brought home a puppy, a little beagle who would be given the name of Freckles. Christine loved Freckles and spent an abundant amount of time with him, referring to the puppy as Frecky. In an interview with Janet Jessup, conducted by The Star, she showed off photos of young Christine, and one included the little girl playing in a pile of leaves with her beloved puppy. Beyond Frecky, Christine also had a pet frog that she kept in the family basement. It was clear that Christine had a love for animals and nature, and in one particular instance, Janet recalled how a bat once got into Christine's bedroom, and while the family were somewhat freaking out trying to get the animal out of the house, Christine remained unbothered by it, having convinced herself that it was just a lonely bird looking for a place to call home. Christine could often be found in the company of her stuffed animals, especially her little stuffed rabbit, Thumper. And while the child had a lot of stuffed animals to choose from, Thumper was always her favorite. Today, Christine's stuffed animals, including Thumper, remain in Janet Jessup's home, surrounded by heartbreaking reminders of the child who was taken from her. Christine was a mixture of many different activities and areas of interest. Sure, she would play dress-up and arrange her dolls into complex scenarios while giggling, but she'd also run around outside, climbing trees. She loved sports, especially baseball. Her mother described her once as both being a tomboy and having a feminine, sensitive side, and in a world where so many children are cornered into behaving one way or another, Christine was purely and simply herself. Whatever her interest that day, she'd pursue it. She was warm, sensitive, funny, adventurous, an outgoing little girl who was full of life. Sadly, she was, in many ways, just the kind of child a sick and depraved person might view as a target. When Christine got a little older, she began riding a new bike, and she absolutely loved it. According to Janet, who described the bike as one of Christine's most prized possessions, the child handled it extremely well, loved riding and laughing as she zoomed down the street and took very good care of it showing just how important to her it truly was. In one particular article on YorkRegion.com, I found an interesting little quote which described Christine as bubbly, small, and responsible. Her relationship with her brother Kenny was both close and complicated. Kenny was five years older than Christine, which can be somewhat of a difficult gap to overcome for siblings, but it's clear Kenny looked very lovingly at his little sister and took it as part of his responsibility to look out for her. Perhaps that contributes to the guilt he feels for the day his sister disappeared, as Janet has taken Kenny to a dentist appointment so no one was home at the time. In regard to Christine's father, Bob, not a ton of information is available, but I've seen multiple references to the fact that at the time of his daughter's disappearance, Bob wasn't home because he was serving time in prison, which had begun just three weeks earlier. The morning of Wednesday, October 3rd, 1984, began as so many others had. The Jessup children were awoken early to get dressed, grab some breakfast, and then head off to school for the day. Christine, nine years old at the time, was in fourth grade and always excited to get to school, which she attended at nearby Queensville Public School. She very much enjoyed being around her friends and had a propensity for learning. She was, in many ways, a sponge who enjoyed soaking up all of the knowledge, but she also liked laughing with her friends and playing with her toys. On this particular day, Christine was set to take the bus home from school where she'd let herself into the family home due to the aforementioned dentist appointment. This was not the first time Christine was responsible for looking after herself, and she'd proven to be very responsible and reliable in the past. While in retrospect, some people may view this as too much responsibility for a child, you have to remember this was the early 1980s and things were simply different back then. While in school that day, Christine spent time with her friend, Leslie Chipman. The two made plans to get together after school that afternoon. According to Chipman, the plan was for both children to rush home after the bus dropped them off, at which time they'd gather up their dolls and head to a nearby park to play. Also that day in school, Christine had received a recorder, a small plastic woodwind-style instrument from the flute family, but with a whistle-like mouthpiece. Christine was excited about the instrument, which had a paper with her name written on it taped to the side, 
and was seen later playing with it around town. While the exact times vary, depending on the source you're looking at, it's believed that Christine exited the school bus being dropped off on Leslie Street sometime between 3.40 and 4 p.m. Leslie Street runs north and south parallel with Highway 404 and crosses the main street of Queensville. Christine would exit the bus at her usual drop-off to the north of the Main Street intersection, near the park where she was planning to meet up with Chipman, but she had to get home first to drop off her backpack and gather up her dolls. Around this time, Chipman allegedly sat down to watch television with her brother until around 4 p.m. Assuming that Christine may already be on her way, Chipman grabbed her toys and told her parents she was heading to the park and went on her way. She arrived at the park but found no trace of Christine, though she would wait there assuming her friend would come along any minute, but Christine would never arrive. When Chipman headed towards the park, she'd have taken Leslie Street and thus had a good look down in the direction of Christine's home from where the nine-year-old would be coming, and at no point has she ever reported seeing Christine after school that day. Chipman returned home, placing a call to Christine's house at approximately 4.10 but received no answer. She called back 10 minutes later, and Kenny answered the phone, explaining that Christine wasn't there. It's difficult to know with 100% certainty the time or order things occurred in for Christine that day, but there are pieces of information that can confirm some of her comings and goings that afternoon. When Janet and Kenny arrived home that day, sometime between 4.10 and 4.20 p.m., just 30 to 40 minutes after Christine had hopped off the bus, they found several items indicating that Christine had, at a minimum, made it into the home. Firstly, that day's mail had been removed from the mailbox and was placed on the kitchen counter, something Christine often did if she was the first to reach the mailbox. Beside the mail on the counter, the Jessops also found Christine's backpack. Beyond that, there was one detail which Janet herself found troubling as soon as she saw it. Christine's prized bike was present at the home, but rather than sitting neatly with its kickstand up, as Christine always left it, this day, the bike was lying on the ground, partially blocking the entranceway to the home. Janet would later state, quote, That bike was her pride and joy. She would never just throw it down. End quote. Assuming Christine may have went out to play, despite Janet's orders for her to stay home, they weren't immediately panicked, though the condition in which Christine's bike was found did rouse some suspicion. As the hours slowly began passing, concern was growing, as it was highly unlike Christine to not have come home by dinner time. Janet began dialing numbers, calling around to the parents of Christine's friends in hopes of locating the nine-year-old who, it was hoped, may have simply lost track of time. However, as each call ended in the same way, with no one having seen Christine after school that day, Janet and Kenny began searching on their own. The two went around town looking for Christine, even stopping by the park, but there was no sign of the nine-year-old. Finally, at approximately 7 p.m., Janet had no choice but to call the police and report her young daughter missing. It was a devastating call to make, and Janet could feel her stomach sinking into her guts as she dialed. The responding agency was the York Regional Police, which took in the missing persons report and then quickly assembled a team to begin the search of the town, it was during this search that investigators began to put together a thin timeline of events leading up to Christine's disappearance. They knew that she had arrived home before 4 p.m., brought in the mail, and then headed back out of the house. Between 4 and 4.30, several witnesses noted seeing Christine walking away from the family home toward Main Street. There was a corner store that Christine and her brother would frequent, where they would buy candy, typically gum, this particular store was located a short distance from the park where she was supposed to meet Leslie Chipman. In fact, the park itself could be seen as soon as you walked out of the door of that convenience store. One witness, a Robert Atkinson, reported to police that he had seen Christine outside of the convenience store still carrying her plastic recorder. I should note, the timelines are all messed up in this case, and we'll get more into that later, but this report places Christine at the store sometime between 3.45 and 3.50 p.m. This is a very tight window of time if her school bus dropped her off sometime between 3.40 and 4 p.m. Initially, police believed that Christine had been taken somewhere near her home, but later study would determine that she may have disappeared on her way to or after arriving at the park. 
All that was known then, and to a certain degree now, some 34 years later, is that Christine disappeared in the small stretch of town between her home, the store, and the park. In the first days of the search, multiple tipsters called in. Several of them told investigators that they had seen a female child who resembled Christine in one of several different vehicles heading in different directions. While the tips were investigated, they didn't lead to any developments, and in totality, authorities didn't know how many of the tips were truly reliable or just involved seeing a car drive by with a female child in it. Despite a widespread and exhaustive search involving both police and local volunteers, nothing could be found to indicate where Christine Jessup could have gone or been taken to. It didn't take authorities long to classify the case as an abduction, as there was no way the nine-year-old could evade a search of that scope on her own, nor would she have wanted to. Christine was extremely close with her mother, and according to Janet, would never have run away. During the course of their investigation, police slowly began zeroing in on one potential suspect, a 23-year-old neighbor of the Jessups named Guy Paul Morin. Morin, who worked for a furniture company and lived with his parents, led a somewhat closed-off life. His circle of friends wasn't large, and he wasn't the kind of guy who went out partying a lot. He played several instruments, including clarinet, had a small band he would play with, and had a girlfriend. Morin had no history of arrests, no trouble with the law, nothing in his past which would indicate that he could have been involved in the abduction of a child, and yet, in a case with few leads, he became the straw police would begin grasping at. Allegedly, interest in Morin was stoked when several people referred to him as somewhat strange. I would also imagine that the idea that Christine had last been seen with a recorder and Morin played clarinet may have presented the possibility of a scenario under which the older man could have approached the child and used music as a method to gain her trust. While investigators furthered their exploration of Morin, a dog used in the search for Christine allegedly made an indication at the Morin family vehicle. When asked, authorities were given permission to search the vehicle, at which time they recovered several fibers which were sent to the Ontario Center for Forensic Sciences. The more police looked, the more they felt Morin knew more than he was sharing, but there was one major problem with their suspicions. Morin had an alibi, and a good one at that. According to the company for which Morin worked, his time card from that Wednesday showed that he had clocked out of work at 3.32 p.m. After clocking out of work, Morin stopped at a store and purchased a lottery ticket, which the clerk confirmed selling to him. He then went grocery shopping, filled the family's vehicle with gas, and arrived home between 5 and 5.30 p.m. The time of his arrival was confirmed by his brother-in-law, who told authorities that as he was leaving the Morin home between 5 and 5.30, he witnessed Morin pulling into the driveway, at which time they had a short discussion. According to Morin's parents and sister, after unloading the groceries, Morin entered the home and took a nap, waking up around 6.30 p.m. For the rest of the evening, he worked outside with his father, doing home repairs which he frequently assisted with. There was no indication that Morin had left the home any time until the next day, and while authorities would later argue that Morin's family were, at a minimum, wrong about the times, and at a maximum, covering up for him, no evidence was ever produced to contradict this alibi. However, there were plenty of suspicions. Morin was examined extremely closely under a sharp microscope. When the man failed to show up as a volunteer to search for the missing child, police noted this as bizarre. Sadly, despite all efforts, no trace of Christine could be located. With each passing day, the Jessup family became more engrossed and more concerned while investigators slowly began to move away from the case. It remained active and open, Leads were being tracked and tips followed up on, but they had almost nothing to work with. Perhaps that's why they focused in so tightly on Morin, hoping against hope to find the answers sooner than later. Missing persons flyers were produced and placed all around town, expanding out further and further. There wasn't a single person in Queensville who hadn't heard about Christine's disappearance, and it completely rocked the tight-knit community. It was difficult to imagine that a child predator could have been walking the streets of their town, and worse yet, maybe a resident of it. Months began passing. Thanksgiving that year occurred on October 8th, five days after Christine had disappeared. The next major event was her 10th birthday on November 29th, 
but even a month and a half later, police had developed few, if any, leads. Christmas was especially difficult that year, trying to imagine where Christine could be and if she was all right. Sadly, the tragic answer to that question would come just six days later, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, 1984, when Christine's remains were found on the edge of a field in the community of Sunderland, some 41 kilometers or 25 miles to the east of Queensville. The location in which Christine's remains were located sat on the border between the regions of Durham and York to the northeast of Toronto. While the details of the way in which Christine was found are publicly available, I'm going to describe the scene as discreetly as I can, sparing too much of the intense details. These can be easily located if you're so inclined. Court documents indicate that, when found, Christine was lying on her back with her legs open, knees pointing away from her body. Christine was dressed only in a beige turtleneck covered by a blue sweater over which she wore a blouse. I should note, I've read several reports in which the blue zippered sweater was not in fact found on Christine and possibly has never been located, but there's too much confusing information for me to verify that. Investigators noted at the scene that several buttons were missing from Christine's blouse. Due to the time her remains had laid exposed to the elements, extensive decomposition had already taken place, making it difficult to determine everything at the scene. However, it was clear to indicate that the nine-year-old was nude from the waist down, her pants, belt, and shoes lying in a pile at the bottom of her feet. The child's underwear were lying near her right foot, balled up. It was a grisly and disturbing scene. An autopsy would later determine that the nine-year-old had been beaten and murdered by way of multiple stabs to her upper body. Her chest laid partially cut open, and several vertebrae had been broken, the child having been nearly decapitated due to the strength and severity of the stabs. The child had been sexually assaulted and her killer had left behind semen on her underwear, though in 1984, DNA was still a very new process which had yet to obtain legal substantiation, that coming two years later in 1986 during an investigation. In the United States, the first trial to admit DNA as evidence leading to a conviction occurred in 1987. It was a horrifying reality for all involved. Investigators were stunned by the brutality of the crime carried out against a 4 foot 9 inch tall, 40 pound 9 year old. The Jessup family was absolutely devastated, trying to comprehend what kind of a monster could have committed such a heinous crime against Christine was unimaginable. It was believed that Christine had been abducted and sexually assaulted somewhere else, with her body being placed in the field afterward. There has been some debate about whether or not the child was still breathing when her killer left her out in the cold, wet darkness of Sunderland that October night. According to weather reports, there was a high of 24 degrees and a low of 5.6 degrees Celsius that day. That's a high of 75.2 and a low of 42 degrees in Fahrenheit. Nine-year-old Christine Jessup was laid to rest in Queensville Cemetery, 20778 Leslie Street, not far from her home nor the park she often played in. Her tombstone reads, quote, In loving memory of Christine Marion, dear daughter of Robert and Janet Jessup, sister of Kenneth, end quote. Investigators noted that Morin did not attend the funeral, which they made note of being strange as well. In a terrible turn of events, Christine's family visited the site in which her remains were found, at which time they found four human bones. After Christine was later exhumed, the bones were confirmed to have belonged to her. Due to the location of her remains, the Durham Regional Police became involved, eventually taking the lead over from the York Regional Police. In a meeting between the two agencies to discuss the case, one piece of information was delivered to the Durham Police. Investigate Guy Paul Morin. The Durham police certainly followed that directive, and before long, Morin was their prime suspect in the murder. Less than five months after the discovery of Christine's remains, Morin was arrested in April of 1985 for the abduction, assault, and murder of Christine Jessup. This came after several conversations between police and Morin, including a January 1985 interrogation in which investigators felt that Morin exhibited odd behaviors, made statements about the corruption of little girls, 
and perhaps made references that could indicate knowledge of the site where her remains were found, according to the Canadian Encyclopedia.ca. There was even a partial profile developed by John Douglas of Mindhunter fame who believed at the time that the perpetrator was likely a loner, white male, in his early to mid-twenties. This seemed to fit Morin to a T. The ensuing trial was, for the most part, a media circus and an extremely hyperbolic exchange of information. Prosecutors worked hard to depict Morin as a sick loner who had become obsessed with his nine-year-old neighbor. There were several areas to explore in regard to Morin's possible involvement. Firstly, that he lived close to the victim's home. Secondly, police contended that fibers found in the family vehicle were verified through lab tests to have belonged to a sweater owned by Christine Jessup. Beyond that, a hair found on Christine's remains was allegedly confirmed to have come from Morin's body, and then there were the two so-called informants. While in custody and awaiting trial, Morin had allegedly admitted to committing the crime in discussions with an inmate and a police officer who was operating undercover as Morin's cellmate. The prosecution argued that much of Morin's alibi for the day of the murder was given by friends and family who may have lied to protect him. The Jessops were brought in to testify, giving different accounts of the timeline in which Morin could have been afforded the ability to have committed the crime. Years later, the Jessops would admit that the Durham police had insisted that Morin had committed the crime and, in not so many words, suggested that if the family had been wrong about their own timeline, Morin could have a window of opportunity. This led to family members testifying that the times were different than they'd actually remembered, hoping to help close the net on this man who they had been promised was the killer. While Morin's lawyer argued his client's innocence, he also presented an innocence by reason of insanity defense, arguing that Morin may be schizophrenic and could have committed the crime during a hallucination. To the shock and surprise of both police and the Jessup family, the jury ultimately acquitted Morin of the crime. The prosecution wasn't done yet, though, and filed an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada who, in 1988, ordered a new trial to take place. It was through this retrial and Morin's hiring of a new attorney that new and disturbing details about not only the case, but Christine's past would come to light. Firstly, it was revealed that police had not turned over all reports and evidence to the defense at the first trial. Amongst these reports was an interview with Christine's brother, Kenny, during which time he admitted that he, along with two older boys, had sexually assaulted Christine beginning when she was possibly as young as two years old. The media and the defense ran with this information, depicting Kenny as a malicious child abuser. However, Kenny argued that he was only 12 years old at the time and that he, too, had been sexually assaulted by the older boys. While Kenny was now being depicted as a predator, he replied later, telling YorkRegion.com, quote, we were being abused. They tried to make me the abuser, end quote. The defense argued that there were suspects who had been ignored by police due to their tunnel vision of Morin and that much of the evidence they had provided from the fibers to the timeline had been fabricated. While Morin's defense was actually much better in his retrial, again in a shocking turn, a jury found him guilty on July 30th, 1992. This time, the media reacted in the opposite way of the first trial, and instead started presenting stories that argued for Morin's innocence. Morin's lawyers quickly filed an appeal, and in an unusual move, Morin himself was granted release on bail pending the result of his appeal. This time, however, Morin would have new technology in the corner of his defense, DNA. The semen found on Christine's underwear had been previously tested, but they'd been unable to obtain and confirm a DNA signature. However, by the time of the appeal rolling around in 1995, technology had advanced enough. A lab based out of Boston, Massachusetts, was able to develop a DNA signature from the sample, and that DNA was not a match for Guy Paul Morin. This new evidence, on top of testimony by Kenny about how the police had convinced him to lie about the timeline, exonerated Morin. Morin would go on to receive $1.2 million for wrongful prosecution. The problem was, where was there to go now? Eleven years had passed since Christine had been murdered and the majority of that time had been spent focusing in on Morin, who had now been completely exonerated. 
When asked later about Moran's innocence, Janet told TheStar.com, quote, We have to live through hell on earth for the rest of our lives. We have no closure. But that's not Guy Paul Moran's fault. I'm not blaming him, don't get me wrong. But I think for victims' families that have gone on this long, holy Nelly, man. End quote. A task force was established to try and renew the investigation. During this time, they obtained more than 300 DNA samples from potential persons of interest, but never did find a match to the DNA on file. Toronto Police Superintendent Neil Tweedy had co-headed the task force. He later told the Globe and Mail, quote, It stays with us. It becomes personalized. Nobody wanted to solve this crime more than us, and we were very confident it was solvable. There were about five cases where we became really, really excited, but we were able to prove that it wasn't them. You could say that after 20 years, there's little hope left, but I don't think that. End quote. While the task force ultimately disbanded in 1998, the case remained active only being passed on to cold case investigators around the turn of the millennium. So much time had passed. Memories get foggy. People who may have been involved move away. The more the media and private agencies dug into the investigation into Christine's murder, the more mistakes and outright lies they found on the part of investigators. The poor manner in which the case was handled deeply rocked both the Jessups and the entire community's faith in local law enforcement, let alone their ability to solve this horrible crime. Authorities are, however, in possession of the killer's DNA to this day. It's been compared to samples from hundreds of others, some volunteering their blood for testing, others being compared when arrested for other crimes. No matches have yet been made. There have been suspects named, though not by authorities. YorkRegion.com wrote a three-part series about Christine's murder, and as a result of that series, multiple people called in potential tips. One connected to a man who lived above the convenience store where Christine was last seen. This particular man allegedly had a violent past and moved out of Queensville shortly after the crime had been committed. Another suspect, since deceased, allegedly lived near the Jessup's home at the time and may have been sexually abusing his own daughter. One man claimed his father admitted to the crime shortly before committing suicide, but this man is hesitant to come forward publicly as he doesn't want his family targeted for the actions of his father. The tips and suggestions go on like this, but as of yet, no one has ever been tracked down as a legitimate suspect, nor have any DNA matches been established. Interestingly, while many have looked at neighbors and strangers as potential possibilities, criminal profiler John Douglas has his own beliefs. Douglas believes that Christine probably knew her killer and that the child more than likely went along willingly with this person. Douglas described the crime scene as unorganized and sloppy, leading him to believe that the killer was likely unorganized and sloppy. In totality, Douglas told TheStar.com that the killer likely had a criminal record for arson or animal cruelty, possibly had scars on his face, and may have been experiencing an emotional upheaval due to a breakup or perhaps a divorce between his parents. Considering the remote location in which Christine was recovered, authorities have long believed that her killer was not a drifter, but someone who knew both Queensville and Sunderland quite well. There's a chance that her killer is still living in that area. Nearly 35 years have passed since Christine Jessup was abducted, assaulted, and murdered. For her family, the hope that the truth will be found remains present, but thinning over time. With the actions of investigators early on, Kenny has admitted his resentment, both for being manipulated to lying about the timeline and believing that investigators hadn't focused on Moran so closely, they may have found the actual killer. Kenny does believe, however, that the DNA will ultimately prove who committed the crime, saying, quote, One day there will be an announcement. We made a match. Then there will be a press conference. I miss her. End quote. Kenny created a website and social media pages to try and gather information about his sister's murder, but eventually had to turn away from them, the overwhelming emotional impact being too difficult to live with and many people accused him of the crime due to his revelations about the sexual assaults that had taken place. In a mystery this disturbing, which has remained unsolved for as long as it has, you'd imagine there'd be more specific theories, but there really aren't. There are essentially two theories in this case. 
three if you count those who still believe Morin committed the crime, but I'm not amongst that group. The first theory argues that Christine's abduction and murder was completely random. Whether this was a crime of opportunity with someone seeing the child on the street by herself the afternoon that she was taken and simply made the choice to go for her, or perhaps someone from the area who had no connections to her but developed a fascination and desire for her. The second theory follows along the thought processes of John Douglas, that this crime was committed not only by someone Christine knew, but likely someone she trusted who was able to convince the child to go along with him for one reason or another. This person may have known the family and been aware that Christine's father was out of the picture at the time, making the nine-year-old more vulnerable in being home alone and on her own a little more often than she used to be. Janet Jessup's life was forever changed that fateful day in October of 1984. She lost her only daughter and has never received answers as to why or who could have done it. Several years after Christine's murder, Janet and Bob divorced. Bob later moved on, marrying again, but Janet never has. She has since moved out of Queensville, the memory is too difficult to confront, though she does visit her daughter's grave and wonder if the truth will ever be found. When asked about the whole situation, Janet remarked about where Christine might be today. If alive, Christine would be turning 45 years old on November 29th, the same day I'll turn 37. It's difficult not to wonder where she'd be in her life, and Janet had noted that this killer destroyed not only her family, but the family Christine could have had. When asked about it all, Christine, Morin, the investigation, everything, Janet replied, quote, I've often been asked if I feel sorry for the Morins. In a way, I do. But he was young enough to get on with his life and have a family. We weren't. We lost the ultimate. Don't think there aren't days where I close the door and think, stop the world. I just want to get off my bike. But you just can't. End quote. The obviousness of the pain felt by the Jessup family is palpable, nearly overwhelming. Janet Jessup has exuded strength and courage in the face of a terrible tragedy that few could ever recover from. But for her, it's not about recovery. It's about justice. It's about closure. In an interview with the CBC, Janet stated, quote, I've been thinking about it. 30 years is a long time, no doubt about that. And I think of who did it. I think of her, what she looked like, what we'd be doing. It never goes away, and the anniversaries seem to get, I'll say, a little bit easier as time goes on. And yet 30 years, that hits, that hits hard, and you haven't received any answers. A lot of people don't listen to cases involving children. A lot of podcasts won't even cover them. I feel like they're important to address, not just because every case matters, but because the large percentage of people who avoid them. I understand, and I'm not judging anyone for that, doing cases involving children is incredibly hard on me. But I believe there needs to be more coverage in this area. Who knows who might be listening? Who knows what it might remind them of or make them think of? What detail they may connect that wouldn't have happened if the case wasn't covered. The abduction and murder of Christine Jessup is an absolutely heartbreaking case. To imagine that someone could have done such horrible things to a child is something I'll never be able to wrap my head around, no matter how many times I have to cover it. I can't imagine what that family's gone through. The pain of knowing what happened and the frustration with an investigation that focused all efforts on a man who was ultimately innocent. How much vital time was lost? How often did the killer read the news about the Morin trial and smirk to himself knowing he'd gotten away with it? Thoughts like that just piss me off. If there's one thing in all of my time working in true crime that annoys me beyond my ability to express, it's when a case goes unsolved not just because of poor investigative work, but outright lies and manipulated evidence. Unfortunately, we don't have a ton to work with here. While we live in a world where DNA means a great deal to investigations, ever since the DNA signature of Christine's killer was locked in in 1995, they've never had a single match. Somewhere, someone matches that DNA, and how that person has managed to avoid ever being captured is mind-blowing. This case reminds me somewhat of another Canadian case I covered a long time ago, the murder of Dana Bradley. Another young girl abducted, assaulted, and murdered, and left in a remote area. I don't think the two cases are connected, 
but it just horrifies me how many times this has happened and how many killers have gotten away with their crimes. So what do we know? We know that Christine was a sweet little girl who went down to the corner store to pick up some gum and was never seen again. Three months later, she was found in a field in Sunderland some 30 minutes from where she disappeared. By everything that we know, she'd been left there the day she was abducted and laid exposed to the weather for nearly 90 days before she was found. For many, especially those living in the area, it was impossible to accept that this crime could have been committed by a local. And so we'll move into the first theory that the murder of Christine Jessup was a random act of violence possibly conducted by someone passing through or visiting the area. There's a couple of reasons to believe this could have been a crime committed by someone from outside the area. Firstly, nothing else like this happened in the area. You'd imagine if someone had a propensity for abducting, assaulting, and murdering young girls, there'd be more than one. I often think about how Leslie Street, which Christine had walked a thousand times in her life, runs parallel to Highway 404. How hard would it be to grab a child, pull onto the 404 or any number of roads really, and be hundreds of miles away before anyone noticed Christine was missing? I suppose anything is possible. It wouldn't be the first time we've seen a case where someone comes into a small town, commits a horrible crime, and then moves on down the road, continuing their acts of depravity in new places where people don't have the time to connect the dots. That's certainly something that could have happened here. If someone were out just looking for possible targets, they'd likely know what time school let out. If they happened to be heading down Leslie Street that particular afternoon, they had several options. Christine was out there, but so was her friend Leslie Chipman and numerous other children in the area who were out looking to play. What was it about Christine that made her the option worth taking? Perhaps nothing more complicated than finding her alone without anyone else around. Perhaps there was something about the young girl that caught the killer's eye. That we may never know. As I mentioned previously, John Douglas did look at this case and gave a profile, though there isn't much to work with. Likely a white male in his early to mid-twenties, possibly from a family that experienced or was experiencing a divorce. Douglas thought that the killer likely had difficulty holding down a job, may have been dating someone, and possibly had scars on his face. I'm not exactly sure the origin of the scars on the face angle, but maybe that's a detail law enforcement has held back all these years. Douglas, though, thought that the killer would have had a criminal history, likely related to arson or animal cruelty, two factors of the McDonald triad missing only bedwetting, which seems to indicate that Douglas believed this was a killer who had either struck before or would strike again, just perhaps not in Queensville. There's not a lot to examine here, as frankly, there's not a lot we know for sure. However, looking at this theory, it's difficult to completely dismiss it. How easy is it for a predator driving down the road to meet the eyes of a young child and by one way or another convince her to get into the car? Let's face it, we know people like this are typically very skilled at manipulating adults, which to me means they wouldn't find it that difficult to manipulate a child either. Once Christine had gotten into the car, it would basically be over. There would be no escape for her. One thing I find interesting is that multiple investigators have made notes about the location at which Christine was found. They pointed out that the sexual assault and the murder itself likely didn't take place at that location, and they can't help but wonder why. There were buildings in the area in which a killer could have worked without being noticed. There was a lot of open land not being monitored. Why did the killer conduct his crime elsewhere, and why did he choose this particular location as his dumping ground? I read one analysis which theorized that the killer may have had some kind of a reverence for this location and didn't want to besmirch it by conducting the crime there, only leaving Christine there because he knew he was unlikely to be seen doing it. Of course, that would indicate that the crime was committed by someone local or someone who knew the area, which directly contradicts the theory of it being a passerby. But that doesn't mean this person couldn't have still been a stranger and living in the area committing this crime at random. It could have been someone who lived in the area but simply didn't know Christine or her family. If the person lived in the area, maybe they'd seen her being dropped off by the bus, noticed her walking home alone, and realized there was an opportunity there. In one particular article, they addressed the fact that Christine's father was in prison at the time, having gone away some three weeks previous. Maybe this person could have been aware of that as well. The problem with the random stranger theory is that, despite access to various highways and roads in the area, 
Christine wasn't found hundreds of miles away. She was found at the edge of farmland in Sunderland, surrounded by back roads in an area most people believe would only have been known to a local. You're not going to simply stumble upon this farmland. You have to know that it's there. You have to travel the back roads and you have to know what you're looking for. What about the possibility of someone who lived in the Sunderland area and maybe visited Queensville, whether it be for work, to visit friends or relatives, or maybe some unknown reason? That's certainly a possibility. I'd like to say investigators at the time dug into that possibility, but we pretty much know they didn't. This was looked at later, but a decade had already passed. A lot of things had changed, and the killer could have moved on or even died by then. So, this absolutely could have been a random crime, committed by someone passing through or someone who lived nearby, but not directly in Queensville. But for the most part, investigators, both public and private, tend to believe that Christine was a savvy nine-year-old who knew better than to just go along with a total stranger. That doesn't rule out the possibility of her being taken by force, though again, most who have dug into the case, including John Douglas, believe Christine knew her attacker and went along willingly. So that leads us into the second and only other theory, that this crime was committed by someone close to Christine or her family who she recognized and would go along with. This is the theory people never like, the one that means that a child predator or murderer could be living in your town. The thing is, Queensville isn't just a small town. It's part of a much bigger area with over 20,000 people living there. That's a lot of potential suspects. And much like other larger areas, there are suburbs. And many times, people who work in the bigger town live in the smaller one. But let's throw all of that out for a moment and just look at the day all of this happened and the circumstances surrounding Christine and her life. Firstly, I have to address Kenny's revelation about the sexual assaults that had taken place. In some places I've read they began as early as Christine being two years old, in others I've read it began around the time she was seven. And while this is an exceedingly disturbing detail to give you, I feel it's important. The information about the sexual assaults was not just limited to improper touching, to put it mildly. There was mention of sexual intercourse being forced. Now, Kennedy was younger at the time, and the two boys who appeared to be the driving force behind this assaulted him as well. A lot of people looked at Kenny like a monster for his role in this, but I think it's difficult to judge the behaviors of a child between the ages of 7 and 12 who's involved in being sexually assaulted. Obviously, this wasn't his idea, and who knows what those boys did to him in order to get him to comply. I've often wondered if those boys were questioned, had their blood taken and DNA compared to the sample found in Christine's underwear. No arrests have ever been made, so I'm left to believe that either none of that happened or the samples didn't match. Either way, that opens the door to a whole world of sick possibilities, from the kids conducting these sex crimes to even their parents or older friends that they may have had. A lot of times in these cases when children exhibit behaviors of sexual assault, it's as a result of being sexually assaulted themselves. I hope, if nothing else, investigators at least dug into this possibility to rule out or in potential suspects unless they were too busy chasing after Morin. You'd imagine that police looked at anyone close to the family, anyone in the family, anyone who may have known Christine by whatever measure of acquaintance, teachers, friends, parents, delivery men, what have you. Again, I don't have a lot of faith in the way this investigation was handled, so I honestly don't know what areas they dug into at the time. I know in the years since, the task force looked into a lot of different things, and the cold case detectives have worked very hard on this case, hoping to find something new, but unfortunately, their predecessors screwed this investigation up from the get-go. So, all we can really work with is what we know, and how it possibly could have played out. I don't know what kinds of people were hanging around the Jessup family, though in at least one article there was reference to DNA testing known pedophiles, some of whom were peripherally connected to the family, by way of friendship, relatives of friends, co-workers, etc. That's a really wide pool of people to look at, so it's difficult to say anything for sure, though I tend to agree that the killer was likely someone that Christine knew in some way, shape, or form. I also find it interesting that the day of the attack happened to be a day that her brother was being taken to the dentist and likely wouldn't be around to protect her. So is it possible that someone knew he wouldn't be there that day? Is it also possible that this person knew that Christine's father had been sent away to jail and he wouldn't be there either? I don't think those are things that you can completely ignore out of hand. Now, 
I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times I find that when I'm looking at cases of children being assaulted and murdered, I'm always thinking about adults. But this is a situation that we can't really do that in. There's a possibility that Christine's assailant could have been a child, likely not nine years old like she was, but there's a possibility you could be looking at a teenager. I know Douglas profiled that this person was likely in his early to mid-twenties, but for a moment, let's imagine he's not. We know that Christine was sexually assaulted by boys who were six or seven years older than her. Why couldn't someone of that age have also been involved in her murder? The location of her remains was described as unorganized and sloppy, which to me is a pretty accurate description of most teenagers that I know. How many of you have teenage children? How often do you walk into their bedrooms and wonder how the hell it got so messy? I don't have kids, but I have friends who have teenagers, and organized is not a way I would describe any of them. So given the history of what happened to Christine prior to the murder, it's not entirely impossible to imagine that someone who could have known about the assaults might have wanted to participate, or already had. Perhaps this person knew Christine, befriended her, before or after the assaults, and when he finally built up the lust and drive to try, Christine resisted, causing him to lash out violently. What a horrible series of events to imagine. Now, whether we're talking about, say, a 17-year-old or a 21-year-old, we're pretty much in the same ballpark, aren't we? That's the difference between a high school senior and a college junior, generally. We've got a sloppy and unorganized crime scene in a remote location likely to have only been known by people who had been there or grown up in the area. Considering the distance traveled, the killer must have had access to a car. The age at which someone can get a learner's permit or a G1 in Ontario is 16 certainly fits into the range, and if the person had parents who worked later into the evenings and a car was available, that's a definite possibility. But there are reasons I lean towards this person being an adult as well. If you were looking at someone in their 20s, well, they'd have a lot less questions to answer about when the car was taken or where it was driven to, especially if they didn't live with their parents anymore. If this is a person without a job, then they've got a lot of free time to wander around watching things and developing fantasies that they'll ultimately try to act out. I wouldn't be surprised if this person, who likely knew Christine in some way, had been watching her. As mentioned earlier, her father had gone away to prison, and so there were a lot of people who knew the family was less organized than usual. Before you can ask me, I really don't know the details of what Bob was in prison for, but my understanding he was not in prison for a severely long time and it couldn't have been a major crime or he would have served more time. And from everything I've read about investigations, nobody seems to look at Bob and any connections he may have had to anyone as possibly being involved here. Although I don't know how you can completely rule that out because Bob likely knew people who were aware he was going away to prison. Some of those people may have been to his house, and some of those people may have had sick designs on his daughter. In a little town that small, people talk, and someone going to prison becomes common knowledge fairly quickly. We also have to consider friends of the family, people who knew Janet and Bob, people who knew their routine, people who may have even volunteered to help with the searches, and perhaps that's one of the more disturbing aspects of this case. There's a good chance that the person responsible offered their condolences to the family at some point in time. Unfortunately, everyone's a ghost right now. Even those people who wrote to the journalists at YorkRegion.com, most of them didn't want to come directly forward to give the name of the person they thought could have committed the crime. It's difficult to DNA test people when you don't have that information. Some of those individuals had since passed away, making things even more complicated. I would say this, however. If you're one of the people who believes you have an idea of who may have committed this crime, say something. Call the police. Write a letter. Call an anonymous tip line. Send an email. What's the worst that happens? Police investigate it and rule it out. Or maybe, just maybe, they find the person they've been looking for for nearly 35 years. Whoever committed this horrible crime got to live their life in ways that Christine never had the chance. They got to work jobs, find relationships, buy gifts, attend sporting events, do whatever it was that they wanted, do all of the things that they robbed Christine of the ability to do. I mentioned in the evidence section that Christine and I share a birthday. When Christine was murdered, I was going to be turning two years old. I look at everything I've done since that time and realize that most of it are things that she never got a chance to do. She never knew what it was like to fall head over heels in love with someone or the thrill of getting accepted into a college. 
She never got her learner's permit, nor sat behind the wheel of a car. Someone stole everything from her before she even had a chance to imagine wanting it. Thirty-five years is far too long for a family to go without answers. Who knows how many years Janet Jessup has left? How many beautiful moments with her daughter reside now only in the glimmer of her memory? What moments were taken from them? Like Janet herself mentioned, Christine could have been a businesswoman by now, successful and happy. She could have had a family, a few kids running around being the sweet little tomboy she will forever be remembered as. There are a lot of unsolved cases out there, and for many of them, even ones I've covered on this show, we know absolutely nothing besides the fact that someone vanished. Here, we have a small town, a remote location, and DNA on file. There's hope. There's a chance. All it takes is the right name given to the right person. And if not, maybe someday they'll take that DNA and create a profile for a potential suspect. Something to give people something to look at, a visual image, something to open the case back up. However, until something like that happens, the abduction and murder of Christine Jessup remains open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the abduction and murder of Christine Jessup, there are many online forums and articles available. YorkRegion.com has an extensive three-part series which was critical to the research for this case. There have also been several books written about the case. If you have any information about the abduction and murder of Christine Jessup, please contact the Police Homicide Unit at area code 416-808-7400. You can also email them at homicide at torontopolice.on.ca or contact Crime Stoppers anonymously at 1-800-222-8477. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at traceevidencepod, or comment in the Facebook group. What app are you using to listen to podcasts? I've been using the Himalaya app, and I really love the setup. It's so much easier and streamlined than many others. But there's an added bonus with Himalaya. Through the app, you can become a supporter of Trace Evidence. Without even having to leave the app, you can sign up for a small monthly fee that goes directly to production costs for the show. And in return, you'll receive ad-free episodes and access to upcoming monthly bonus premium episodes. If you'd like to test this out, visit Himalaya.com slash Trace Evidence and use the promo code EVIDENCE for one month free. Once you get used to ad-free episodes and bonus content, you won't want to turn back. As some of you are aware, on Patreon, I will begin posting one episode per month that is not available in the normal feed beginning in September. In these episodes, I'll discuss a variety of cases, including solved cases, which are voted on monthly by patrons. These episodes will also be available through the Himalaya podcast app for those who become premium members. But speaking of Patreon, it's time for a shout out to our amazing Patreon producers. Angie Dodd, Emily Smith, Megan Cotter, Kate Alexander, Chandra Moreau, Robbie Blue. Brian Kemmerling, Wannabe Sleuth 2, Laura Dickinson, Julia Rexon, Diane Dyson, Tom Archer, Eamon Brady, Nick Mohar Schurz, Alicia Lorraine, Jessica, Krista Colvin, Randy Wyland, Brittany Bivens, Glenda Piper, and Megan. You're all amazing. And if you're new and I mispronounced your name, just shoot me a message and I'll correct it. As many of you may be aware, I released the first ever exclusive episode of Trace Evidence this past weekend. This episode examined the Chicago Tylenol poisonings of the early 1980s. Each month, I'll tackle a new topic, and you can hear all of the exclusives by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash trace evidence. Today, I'm going to leave you with a small preview of that episode, so I want to thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.
The following is a Trace Evidence exclusive episode. The phone has been ringing off the hook at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. Seven people have now died. A health official said, we're dealing with Russian roulette. Five people are now dead, one in critical condition after taking extra strength Tylenol. Police hunting for the person who laced pain-killing drugs with cyanide. Bottles of the pills with the serial number MC-2880 are being recalled. They'd say it appears the murderer went from store to store in the Chicago area, leaving one bottle in each. Right now they're telling people which lots of Tylenol are known to have contaminated capsules. A new development in the Tylenol murder case. A surveillance photo taken in one of the stores that sold a bottle of the tainted Tylenol. In September of 1982, the city of Chicago was paralyzed with fear as a major health issue began developing. Three individuals died under mysterious circumstances. Medical experts couldn't explain the deaths, but it soon became clear there would be more. In the end, seven people would die after ingesting capsules of extra-strength Tylenol, which had been tampered with. The medication inside of the capsules had been replaced with an incredibly deadly poison, cyanide. A joint effort between local law enforcement, state police, the medical examiner's office, the Illinois district attorney, the mayor of Chicago, and the FBI would ultimately determine that someone had left bottles of the poisonous substance on store shelves in the greater Chicago area. Anyone who had purchased Tylenol in recent weeks could unknowingly have a bottle of the poison in their home. In hopes of stemming the deaths, Police were ordered to remove all Tylenol from store shelves, and soon it would become a nationwide scare, with all 50 states wondering if they, too, could have received the tainted medications. While trying to stop the risks for citizens, police were also trying to determine who could have done this and why. Thousands of names were considered, but at least one made himself a primary target by writing a letter to Johnson & Johnson, the owners of Tylenol, demanding $1 million in ransom or the killings would continue. Was this just an elaborate hoax to try and extort money, or was this the man actually behind the poisonings? Some 37 years later, and the answers remain unknown, with multiple suspects, but no evidence to truly link any of them to the poisonings. Could this truly be the work of one person, or perhaps a network of individuals hoping to create terror on the streets of Chicago? This is Trace Evidence, bonus episode number one, The Chicago Tylenol Poisonings.